Okay, I know it started. I see it started there. Okay, quickly, let's talk about what we did last time. Uh, we introduced our first set of differentiation rules. So on the test, you were asked to use the derivative to prove properties, in particular tangent lines, um, and uh, find derivatives of functions using the definition. Uh, we looked at some examples of what we had done directly from the definition. And when we restated these in terms of exponents, we see a definite pattern. Uh, the power of the original variable expression becomes a coefficient. The old power is one less, so the new power is one less than the old power. And we were able to generalize that to what we call the power rule. And this is one of the most important rules in all of calculus. Doesn't matter uh, for any rational number n, this is the way we take derivatives of powers of the variable. Um, in addition to that, we introduced three other rules. The rule for constants, which doesn't really come under the, the rule for powers in the strict sense. And then the two rules about mul constant multiples and sums and differences. So the derivative passes through those operations. I can take derivatives of sums by taking the sum of the derivatives, and I can take derivatives of constant multiples by taking the constant multiple of the derivatives. So those sort of operations don't enter into the process. And that means we can extend this power rule to general polynomial forms like we did here. You know, in example two, we were able to take a derivative uh, using just those set of rules without having to run all this through the definition. Um, but we do have to have a good handle on exponential forms, negative powers that represent reciprocals, rational powers that represent root powers, and so on. Um, and then, you know, we answer the usual types of questions. Uh, how do I find the tangent line to a curve at a point? Well, I use the derivative to do that. And now we have a whole catalog of functions that we can do this for. And we talked about the significance of the horizontal tangent line. Horizontal tangent lines occur whenever we have a turning point in a function where it changes its behavior from increasing to decreasing or vice versa. That's another thing we're going to want to do quite frequently with these sorts of um, objects. We want to find the um, horizontal tangent lines to the graph because that will tell us something about the graph structure. And shortly, a um, month or so, uh, we'll be doing this uh, we'll be using derivatives to graph, equ graph equations. Right, without having to guess what they look like, without having to use our calculators, we'll be able to graph equations based on the information we get from the derivative. And this is one of those pieces of information that's going to be most significant, identifying the location of the horizontal tangents. <coughs> and then we extended the idea of the derivative to multiple applications. So higher order derivatives, we start with a function, and we repeatedly apply the derivative process as many times as we want. First derivative, second, third, fourth, fifth, however far we go. Uh, for positive powers, I can see that eventually the, all the derivatives start to vanish. Uh, uh, every time I take a derivative down to the constant, after that, everything goes to zero. Um, but for uh, negative powers, it doesn't work that way. Negative powers continue, want, continually increase their negativity with respect to their exponents. Uh, they'll never vanish like positive powers do. Um, but these are just examples of that idea that since the derivative applied to a function is a function itself, I can apply the derivative to it, and so on and so on. So those are uh, three, uh, four rules, four rules of differentiation along with the idea of repeated application of the derivative. And then, what else did we do? Oh, we introduced the, the two other rules. Uh, the product rule, that's my product rule right here. Please notice that unlike sums and differences, the derivative does not pass through those operations. I can't just take the derivative of each function separately and multiply them together. It's much more complicated. And we looked at some examples of that. And the same for the quotient rule. Quotient rule, two functions, a function that expresses a quotient. Uh, I can't just take the derivatives of each function separately and then combine them through the quotient. It's much more complicated. Uh, but these two rules do have something in common. They have a common form. Um, but uh, that's our next set of rules, uh, product and quotient rules. And we'll get some examples of that. So what does that give us now? One, two, three, four, five, six rules, right? Rules for constants, the uh, linear properties, sums and constant multiples, power rule, quotient rule, product rule. There's our six rules. <coughs>
and so today we want to continue on in that vein. In fact, the next couple of weeks, that's all we're going to be doing. We're going to be extending uh, definitions of different types of functions and how they behave under the derivative process. And today, uh, we want to look at trigonometric functions. So how do trigonometric functions behave under the process of um, differentiation? Um, now I want to look at this in two ways. Um, first of all, I want to look at the graph of one of our basic trigonometric functions. Um, which function is this? It's cosine function. So here's a graph of the cosine function. Okay, now according to my understanding of how derivatives work, every derivative corresponds to the slope of a tangent line. Um, hmm, maybe I should, well, we'll say. So every derivative corresponds to the slope of a tangent line. Uh, when I look at this graph, where do I see horizontal tangent lines? Probably I do need to label these. Well, no, nah, I won't do it now. Uh, but right here, for example, right here, that graph has a horizontal tangent line. What's the slope of the horizontal tangent? Zero. So the derivative of this function must be equal to zero at this point. So if this is a graph of y, then the derivative must contain this point. And the same here. Here's another location where this graph has a horizontal tangent line. So the derivative corresponds to the slope of that line. The slope of that line is zero, so the derivative must have this point. The derivative must be zero because that's the way the tangent line behaves there. Um, and of course we know the graph of cosine repeats this behavior up and down, oscillates between over its periods. Uh, you know, I'm going to see another one of these over here. Here's another location where the graph has a horizontal tangent line. Right? It's about to turn around again. So every one of these points where the cosine function hits its maximum value, the derivative is going to zero. All right? What else can I say about this? Uh, what happens here? Uh, after this graph tops out, now the graph is heading in the downward direction. Uh, what do I know about the slopes of the tangent lines as I move over here to this side of the axis? Are they going to be positive or negative? They're going to be negative now. From here to here, in between, all of these slopes actually turn out to be negative. Now, as I'm coming, as I first come out of this point, of this position, they're relatively small negative numbers, but they start to get larger. But by the time I get back down to the second turning point, they start to level off again. And in fact, they probably maximize right here in the middle. They're very not steep at all as I first come out, but the closer I get to this middle point, they get steeper and steeper. But as I pass through here, they start to level off again. So how can I represent that graphically? Well, I might get a picture that looks something like this small negative numbers but increasing up to this point and then they start to go back towards zero. Now what happens to the slopes of the tangent lines as I pass through the second turning point? They're positive. So that means all the derivatives values must be positive. They're very small initially, but as I start to progress further away from the turning point, the slopes become steeper and steeper. They become more positive until I hit the next turning point right here. And then things start to turn around again. But the closer I get to the second turning point, they're starting to level off again. They're still positive, but they're becoming smaller. So once again, what do I see? I see something like this. The lines are positive, getting more and more positive until I get about halfway in between. Now they're going to start to level off again, and as I approach the turning point, they're going back to zero. So just from my understanding of how the uh, derivative is representative of these slopes, I know exactly where these slopes are going to be positive, I know where they're going to be negative, I know where they're going to be zero, I know when they're getting larger, I know when they're getting smaller. This is what I anticipate. I anticipate a picture like this. Starting from the first turning point, small negative numbers getting a little bit larger and then eventually turning back around, getting smaller again on their way back to zero. Then positive slopes, slowly getting larger, some point starting to level back off, approaching the next turning point.
So, what does this look like? Kind of like sine. So this function here, and again, I would see the same thing in this direction. Something like that. Uh, yeah, this looks a little bit like sine, but what's happened is not, this isn't the natural sine function. What's wrong? Yes, yeah, the invert. Well, inverted. So negative. Okay. So that's a hint about the relationship between these two functions. And what we've done here is we've analyzed this graph according to the behavior of the tangent lines. The tangent line being the representative of the derivative allows us to draw a conclusion about what the structure of the graph of the derivative has to look like. It's got to go to zero whenever we have a turning point for the original function. Well, that's what the sine function does. The sine function is going to zero whenever cosine is getting ready to change direction, whenever it's topped out or bottomed out. And the sine function is bottoming out and topping out when cosine's going to zero. Well, that's what I see here. Here and here, when cosine's at zero, that's when the sine function has hit its maximum and minimum values. The only difference here is that this has been re inverted from the natural direction of the sine function. So there's a geometric interpretation of why this is actually the case. The derivative of the cosine function is the negative of the sine function. Okay? Um, now, let me see here. Um, so here are the rules. Here are the two rules for this case. Oh, what? Something happened here. Um... The derivative of the cosine is the negative of the sine function, but it's even simpler for the sine function. The derivative of the sine function is the cosine function. It's an odd relationship. These two functions are related as derivatives of one another, but there is one important difference. Sine, uh, the derivative of cosine, includes the negative. Um, I was going to prove these algebraically. Uh, in order to prove these algebraically, you've, these two limit forms here are important. Uh, this limit form here we proved way back at the beginning of the semester using a table of values. Um, but now I'm, I'm not really interested in proving this algebraically. You can see it. Well, you don't have a textbook. But uh, it's not hard. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I'll post it. I'm not going to go over it, though. But you can prove this. You can actually prove using the definition of the derivative in the algebraic sense. We can actually prove why this is true. Um, but uh, I hope it's clear enough, based on the behavior of this graph, exactly why uh, these two functions end up being derivatives of one another. So there they are. There are the two basic fundamental derivatives of our trigonometric functions. Sine and cosine are related to each other as derivatives. Negative sine is the derivative of cosine. Cosine is the derivative of sine. Um, so here was where I was going to do the proof, but I'm not going to do it now. Um, okay, so let's do it. What's the derivative of this function? F of theta is equal to 2 times cosine theta minus 1 half of sine theta. What's the derivative of this function? Okay, and again, I'm going to do this step by step because uh, not only do we have those two rules about derivatives of the trigonometric functions, but we've also got the sums and differences and the constant multiples. So I'm going to go through this step by step uh, just to make sure um, that um, we've got this straight. Uh, so, and please notice in this case our independent variable is theta. So when we talk about the differential, differential form here, this is d, d theta. So starting from here, step one, I can split this up. I'm subtracting these two terms, so each term can be uh, differentiated separately, and then I can go back and recombine them through the operation. And secondly, I've got the constant multiplier. So the multiplier two, the multiplier one half, those by our rule from last time, don't enter into the process. So those can also be removed. And the only point in this process when I'm actually taking derivatives will be with respect to the two individual functions. The derivative of cosine minus one-half the derivative of sine. 
which is the derivative of cosine? Negative sine. And what's the derivative of sine? Cosine. And then finally, I'll simplify it in the usual way. Negative 2 sine theta minus 1 half cosine theta. Uh, so once again, uh, I, w you know, uh, I don't expect you to go through all this in the, the same sort of excruciating detail, uh, but there are our rules of uh, differentiation being applied in order, taking the difference apart, pulling out the constant multipliers, applying the derivative to each one of the functions, and then putting it all back together. Okay, so that's real, now that I know, and again, uh, if I had, had to have done this to the definition, I'd still be working at this. Um, but uh, based on our understanding of the differentiation laws, that's it. Um, okay, let's look at uh, multiple derivatives, higher order derivatives for these functions. We're going to see an interesting relationship here. Uh, were the successive derivatives of the sine function? So starting from y equals sine theta, what's the first derivative of sine cosine? Okay, what's the second derivative? Negative sine. Okay. So those were just two direct applications of our law. Derivative of sine, we already had that rule, that was this one. Once we obtain cosine from the first derivative, now that gives us a second derivative directly. Okay, now what's the third derivative of sine? So the derivative of sine itself is cosine, uh, but that negative sine is still sitting there that it inherited from the third derivative. Okay, and finally, why, do I, why am I saying finally? Uh, Fourth derivative, what is it going to end up being equal to? So, uh, cosine itself has a derivative negative sine, but there was already negative attached to that. So, the fourth derivative takes us right back to where we started. The fourth derivative of sine is itself. And so now what's going to happen as I repeat this process? Go right back through this cycle. Fifth derivative takes me back to cosine. Sixth derivative, minus sine. Seventh derivative, minus cosine. Eighth derivative, I'm back up to sine. And so on and so on and so on. So this is a very interesting type of behavior. Uh, this is very different from those two multiple derivatives that we applied to those two other function types. Um, reminding ourselves, uh, the uh, uh, polynomial form, the positive integral power, eventually those all disappear. They all go to zero. But the uh, negative powers continue to increase in complexity the further I go. They never start to settle down. They become more and more negative, smaller powers. Alternating between negative and positive, coefficients growing. Very complicated behavior. But the sine function, as I run through its cycle, has four possible valuations sine, cosine, negative sine, negative cosine, and then repeats the cycle over and over again. Um, this is very good for us, right? We're going to, uh, this, the fact that we have this type of behavior for the trick, and of course, cosine does the same thing. Uh, different order, but it does exactly the same thing. It cycles through the four possible positive and negatives. Always that cycle of four units before it returns back to where it started. Um, this turns out to be an important aspect of the uh, trigonometric function. And uh, we'll come back to this. Well, I don't know. It becomes more important than differential equations, but for now, that's something we need to know. <laughs> Okay, so uh, there's two things, two very simple exercises, right? Knowing, having, and again, oh, and by the way, I don't think I said this, but uh, I'm not going to make you memorize these rules. I'll have them summarized on a formula sheet for our next test and quiz. So um, all these rules will be uh, part of our, our new um, packet of formulas, as well as the trigonometric uh, sheet that we used last time. Um, so you don't have to memorize these things, but you do need to know how to apply them.
when you see them. Okay, uh, and now we do have a new sort of function that comes under the rules of the uh, product rule. Um, now, here's two different types of functions being multiplied together. Um, in example A, I've got a polynomial form multiplied by a trig function, and in part, uh, supposed to be part B, in part B, I've got a um, two trigonometric functions being multiplied together. Uh, so this is the kind of arrangement that the product rule was designed to handle. Uh, polynomial forms that we talked about last time when we introduced it are not really essential because polynomials can be multiplied out. But there's no way to get around this. Uh, these two expressions are products and in order to find their derivatives we're going to have to break them down in the appropriate way. So. Okay, so what's the derivative of x squared times sine x? Um, Now, uh, when we introduce the rule, let's go back and look at that rule again. Um, please notice that here I actually used f and g to define the product functions. f represented one product function and g represented the other factor. Um, of course, those names are not really material. Uh, so I'm going to break this down in the same way. Uh, I've got two factor functions here. But I can't call them f and g because I'm, I'm using f to define the big function. Uh, so I think I'll use something else. Um, I'm going to call this function here, I'm going to call this u of x. And this function here, the second factor, I'm going to call that v of x. So that's a little technical detail there. Uh, I already used f, so I can't actually reproduce that directly. Okay, so how do, I, how do I derive the derivative through the product rule? So according to the rule, f prime comes from, and I'm going to go ahead and just list the rule out before we actually start doing the work. Uh, the derivative of the first factor multiplied by the second factor plus the reverse. The function in the first factor multiplied by the derivative of the second. So there's the um, product rule in the most general sense. Okay, so uh, I guess I will need that now. Uh, what is the derivative of the function u? 2x. And what is the derivative of the function v? There you go. Now I'm just going to plug things in. u prime 2x and the function v sine x and then and back the function u is x squared and the function v cosine x. There, see. Um, but this is much more complicated than the original function. It contains multiple factors. In fact, and now I've introduced a second cosine uh, trigonometric operator as well as a new uh, variable term. But once I recognized that as a product and I was able to assign function name to my factors, I, it's just a question of substituting into the formula. Okay, same thing here. This function is contained of two separate factors, each factor representative of a unique function. So I'm going to call the first factor u, I'll call the second factor v, uh, and let's go ahead, uh, we're going to need this in a minute. What's the derivative of u? We just did that, right? Cosine. And what's the derivative of v? Okay, okay so once again, um, what is, how does the derivative of f come about? Uh, just like before, in fact, I'm just going to copy it. Just like before, here's what we're going to end up doing. Uh, we're going to take the derivative of the first function and multiply that by the derivative of the second, and then I reverse. No. First, derivative of the first times the second, plus derivative of the second times first. That's what. Okay, so how is that going to work? U prime is cosine x. 
and V is cosine X. Okay. <coughs> the function U is sine X, and the derivative of the second function is minus sine X. So there I've gone through components, and uh, there's the outcome. But now there's still some work to do. In the previous case, we had pretty much uh, recovered the simplest form. Um, but now there's still some work to do. Um, cosine times cosine, was that equal? Um, so here's our first, uh, we hadn't uh, seen that in this class, back when we did trigonometry, don't forget, when I square the cosine function. Um, now, of course, what I really mean, uh, what this really represents, is the square of the cosine function, cosine x, the quantity being squared. But there's that shorthand that we introduced in pre-calculus 2. Uh, we put the power between the variable and the function name, and that represents the parenthetical expression. So uh, this is a shorthand for the square of the entire okay, expression. And so with that in mind, what am I getting back? Minus from the minus and the plus, and then sine times sine and sine squared. Okay, so there we go. There's the derivative of the product of sine and cosine. It is the difference of the squares of sine and cosine. Um, does that look familiar? <coughs> Some important identities in trigonometry. Now is a good time to review them. Um, what do I get from the sum of squares? Well, there's one of the. There is the fundamental identity in all of trigonometry. Sum of squares of sine and cosine doesn't depend on the variable. It's always equal to 1. What about the difference of the squares? What is it equal to? Let's see here. Where is it? There it is. Yeah. Now I remember seeing that. It's double angle formula for cosine. So this is something, this is why this identity sheet is going to be important. Uh, because uh, part of, especially as we're going to see, and not this time, next time, as we're going to see, um, these identities are going to be required to simplify expressions in the simplest way. Uh, there's up here at the top, there's our Pythagorean identity that we just mentioned. Anytime I end up with a square of the sum of the sine and cosine, always replace that with 1. <coughs> and here's a result that I can actually place with a simpler form. Uh, so recognizing that result as the uh, double angle formula, I can actually express this derivative as cosine of 2x. Um, so that's a fundamental change. That product of the single angle has now generated the double angle for the cosine function. Um, we're going to come back to this. Oh, by the way, that original expression, that should also look familiar. Where does that product of sine and cosine come from? Hmm. Right there. There's that other double angle formula. The product of sine and cosine, or at twice that product, is double angle for sine. Well, now that makes a little bit more sense. What I started with here, in point of fact, this original expression is really just one half of sine of the double angle. If I had known that to begin with, then it's a little bit clearer where this came from. If I start with sine of an angle, then I expect some sense the derivative should involve cosine of the angle. But there has been a transition between these two forms. What happened to that one half? Where did it go? Uh, so anyway, uh, in the, in, on the one, that's the question I'm going to answer next week. 
Um, but uh, there's two different ways of looking at this problem because of my familiarity with those uh, trigonometric identities. Uh, recognizing the product of sine and cosine as an uh, application of the double angle formula and the difference of the squares as an application of the double angle formula for the other. Another way of looking at this same derivative. Uh, in that sense, I didn't need the product rule because the original sine function under double angles is a single thing. Okay, but we're going to say more about this problem later, but there. Uh, I, I didn't have to know any of that. I didn't have to know anything about those identities to be able to produce the difference of squares as the derivative. Okay. <coughs> uh, now's a good time to take a break. Um, so what do we have here? 4, 18. Yeah. Okay, give me 10 minutes. And... Um, We'll do the next, come back and do the next thing.